feel that freedom already. As I pray there, come the Holy Ghost settle in here. Hallelujah. He's good in here. Hallelujah. Oh, we come to worship. Hallelujah. And we have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in
Revelation chapter 17. Let me, before I tell you the verse we're going to look at, let, let, me, let me just give you a little uh, precursor to what we're going to read so you'll understand where we're, what we're reading this morning. Revelation 17 tells of a woman who's riding on a beast. Now, it's, it's all figurative things there, uh, but this beast has seven heads and ten horns. Now, we're not going to get into all that today. We're not going, we're not going to dive into all of Revelation prophecy today. That's not this type of message. But in order to understand the first, you've got to understand what's happening there. Um, there's seven heads. There's, the Bible tells us there's seven mountains. Uh, many believe that that refers to kings and kingdoms that have been before the Antichrist or represent the actual city of Rome. Now, the beast is the Antichrist. Right? Most of us know that. The ten horns represent the kingdoms that would be aligned with the Antichrist. When the Antichrist is there. So the seven are before, the ten are the ones that are there with the Antichrist at that time. But this word, this verse that we're referring to today, and this verse that we're looking at today, is referring to the kingdoms of this world coming against the church, the people of God. So I want to look at verse 14. Revelation 17 and verse 14. Now this is referring to those kingdoms. These these kingdoms shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Today I want to look at those three words, what that means for us. We're called, we're the chosen, and we're the faithful. Father, thank you for your word today. Lord, thank you for, for what you've done in us so far today in Sunday school and in this lesson today. Lord, I pray for, uh, in, this, in this service today. Lord, I thank you, Father, for what you're going to do through this message today, Lord. Lord, I pray that I'll just let you work in this house today. Lord, help me to, to, just, to just let you work through me today, Father. That your anointing will rest upon me today, Lord. You'll anoint the ears of everyone that's here today. Lord, I pray that every distraction would cease in the name of Jesus. And Lord, that you would, that your people would hear what you're speaking through their hearts today. And we'll give you glory, we'll give you praise, we'll give you honor for what you're going to do. In, in, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, they tell us about a trumpet that would sound, the seventh trumpet that would sound. Each one of these trumpets would lead to a different judgment of God pouring out upon the people. It would look differently each time, but the seventh trumpet would sound in Revelation chapter 11, in verse 15, and the seven angels sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of of our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. Re Revelation has constant reminders to us as believers. A lot of people avoid the book of Revelation because they see it as doom and gloom. They see it as, as a, a, a book of the Bible that continues to talk about all the bad stuff that is going to happen. But yeah, they talk about some bad stuff that's going to happen in Revelation. The Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation points us to who Jesus is and to His kingdoms and what Jesus is going to do in those last days on earth and what we have to look forward to even after that. The book of Revelation should bring the believer joy. Because we know in the book of Revelation it's the revelation of Jesus Christ and we know that it tells us time and time again and reminds us in different ways in the book of Revelation and throughout Scripture that in the end, He wins. And He's going to reign forevermore. 
Now we can look around at the world today and it may not seem like he's winning. It may not seem like he's going to win. It may seem like we're on the losing end of this stick. But we're in the Lord's army and as long as we're in the Lord's army, we're going to win. He is the Lord of hosts. And He will lead His army one day and we're going to be with Him forevermore. His Word never fails. He will conquer the evil of this world. The kingdoms of this world will not stand. They cannot stand. This is the question for us today though. Will we stand with Him? He's going to win. The question is, are you going to be on the winning side. Are you going to be, Revelation tells us in verse chapter 17 and verse 14, which we read together, is that tells us what we need to look for if we're going to be on the winning side. If we're going to be on the winning side, we're going to be the called, we're going to be the chosen, and we're going to be the faithful. Those are the ones that will stand with Him in the end. Those are the ones that will be with Him when He shall overcome the kingdoms of this world. Right. Revelation 19 tells us of these people again. And actually, Revelation 17, 14 is just a reference to what will happen in Revelation 19. Revelation 19 tells us, and in verse 11 it says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Thank God for John. Thank God for the Apostle John who saw the revelation and wrote these words down because the same John in John chapter 1 told us He is the Word and the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. This Word is Jesus Christ. We don't have to guess who this person is in Revelation 19 because John told us in John chapter 1 that the Word is Jesus Christ. He dwelt among us. He became flesh. And this says here in Revelation 19.13 his name is called the Word of God. There's no other that is called the Word of God but my, my Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the Word of God. When we follow His Word, we follow Him. But in verse 14 it says, The armies which were in heaven followed Him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he shall smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod and iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. Wait a minute. We just saw that in Revelation 17, verse 14. They, they, on his thigh was a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What we read in chapter 17 was showing us that we will be with Him. We will be those armies that go with Him. We are the called, the chosen, and the faithful that will be with Him. If we can describe ourselves truly as the called, the chosen, and the faithful, then we will be with Him on that day when He conquers the kingdoms of this war. They shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome Him. For He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. Yes. For they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. If I want to be in Revelation 19, then I want to make sure I fit the mold of those in Revelation 17. Those who are with Him, the called, the chosen, and the faithful. So this is the question to you today. Are you with Him? Are you the called? Are you the chosen? Are you the faithful? If we could go back a year ago, I'm going to warn you this morning. I don't like preaching these types of messages. So far, so good, right? But I might hit some of y'all here in a minute. The Spirit of God might hit some of y'all with some words just in a minute. If we are truly the call, 
There might be some of you a year ago that God called you to do certain things. There might be some people in this room that 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago, God called you to do something. And we sit here today and we haven't begun to do what God called us to do. We're the call. I'm reminded of, of what Scripture tells us about our life. Our life but a vapor. It comes and it goes. Yet we hear the voice of God and God calls us and we still sit idle. We don't respond to that call. Some of you have known your calling for years, but you have continued to try to push it out of your mind. You're waiting on your mom or dad to encourage you. And, and let me just stop and say this. I'm not just talking to the kids and the teenagers. You're waiting on your mom or dad to encourage you. You're waiting on your pastor to call you out. But let me help you with something. I can't call you. That's right. Only God can call you. That's right. You know what God has spoken in your heart. I know it's a lot more comfortable to sit on a pew or to sit on a chair. To come to church every every Sunday and just receive. Oh, and trust me. Trust me. I know the sacrifice of answering the call. I live it every day. I know the sacrifice Of not being able to just do everything you want to do. Because there's a call on your life. I know the sacrifice of wanting just to fill your life with, I'm not talking about even bad things. I'm just talking about fill your life with entertainment and the pleasures of this world and to continue to just keep doing things and going through the motions and to live under fear and condemnation all your life. Instead of doing that, to step out of that for a second and for, for a long time, really, and just do the call that God has on your life. He's calling us. See, before when I started talking about the call, the chosen and the faithful, we got a lot of amens. But if we stop and think about what the call means, then the Spirit of God begins to prick our hearts. We begin to really look and search our hearts for who we really are. And if we really fit what God is talking about in Revelation 17, There are some of you that I know are going to have a positive impact on a lot of hurting people, but you refuse to get yourself in position to do that. You've made every excuse in the book. But the truth is, Lord, help me, Jesus. You've let spiritual slothfulness creep in. It's easier just to sit there to have too much responsibility to get out of comfort zone and move forward. Now, before you go there, and before you let your mind continue to go there, let me tell you this. This is not a pastor's way to try to get a load off of him. Because I really don't know what your call is. You do. It may not have anything to do within this church building. It might not help me at all, except it brings more harvest into the, into the house of God that we can pour into. I don't know what your calling is. I can't for for right now. I'm, I'm not God. I can't call you. But but I do know this: that if God has called you to do something, you should be doing. And let me tell you, if you're sitting in this building today, God has a call on your life. Everybody in this world, God has a call on their life. That might mess with some of y'all's theology. Because you think call means you got to preach behind a pulpit or you got to lead a bunch of people. But I can tell you right now, there's some shepherds in this room. 
I've been guilty of it. Can I just be honest with you as a pastor? This might hurt some of y'all's feelings. But I've been guilty of it, and I've said it. I've said it to my wife more than once. That I wish God would just send leaders into our church. People that will lead. People that are natural born leaders. But I don't even think that's, that's God's will. The more, the more I think about it, the more I pray about it, I think what God wants to do is raise up those leaders that are in here so that when other people come in, we can shepherd them. There are some of you that are shepherds and you don't even know it. Well, the pastor's got to be the shepherd. No, there's groups of people that you need to be shepherding. There are people with addictions like you used to have that you need to be shepherding. There, there are people that have gone through the struggles that you've gone through that you need to be shepherding. There are people that, are, that have gone through some of the same hurts and some of the same life experiences that you need to help through life. It might be hundreds of them. It might be two or three. But there's still a reward for you if you'll do the call of God. He's calling you today. He's calling your name today and saying one more time, will you do what I've called you to do? He's calling out this morning. He doesn't have to do it again, but He's calling out to you again and saying, will you do what I've called you to do? Stop wasting time. He's already done this time and time again. But He had me come before you today as an ambassador of Christ to cry out to the Simons and Andrews again. And say, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. To come and find the James and Johnses and say, get out of your boat and follow me. He, he came, I came today to find who the Phillips are that will follow Christ. Yeah. The Nathaniels. That God would say, look, you've tried to hide long enough, but I saw you, Nathaniel. I saw you under the tree. You didn't think I noticed. Follow me, Nathaniel. Zacchaeus. I see you. You've been called out. His disciples are here. And God is saying, Christ is saying to you, go into, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Saul. Saul. You're a chosen vessel. But I'm responsible for so many tests. God, do you know what I've done? Do you know how many times I've hurt you? Do you remember? Have you forgotten all those things that I have done? Do you remember those things I did last week? Why are you calling me? Why is my heart racing the way it is in this chair right now? Why are you doing this to me, God? Because you know what I've done. He said, Saul, I need you to do my work. You've been called for a purpose. You're my chosen vessel. And I don't care what you've done. My light has shined on you. And I'm transforming you. And I need you to do the work that I've called you to do. Stop making excuses. But there's sexual sin in my past. God can't use me. Come on, David. Yeah. Come on, adulterous woman. Get off the ground. Yes. Your accusers don't have a right to stone you. Go and sin no more. Do my work. What about my lack of education? What about my lack of talent? What about my past addictions? What about all those broken relationships? What about my marriage? What about my children? We blame our family for the lack of our calling so much. We need to do the work of God. Maybe your marriage would be better if you would do the work of God. Amen. If you would do the call of God. Hallelujah. My wife is giving me that look, so I know I'm getting mad. I look mad. But I'm mad at the devil. I'm mad at, at the fact that we've got Christians that are sitting in chairs for years and they won't do the work of God. Amen. That many lives can be affected, but we sit in chairs and we take care of me, myself and I. 
But there's many people that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's many people that are pound. There's many people who are sick and don't have to be. But God has called you to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. There's many people who are battling demons and being tormented every night. But they need a church that will walk in the calling of God and lay hands on them and command those demons to flee in the name of Jesus. They need the people. They need people to walk in the calling that God has called them to. He's calling you out. You keep asking God to help you fix the things in the life in your life, but you won't do what He's asked you to do. We keep praying and asking God to do things that we can't understand why God won't do those things that we keep praying and asking God for. What are you doing for Him? He's calling you. He didn't make a mistake. He knew what you did in the past. Stop fighting the call of God. He said you're the called. If you're, if you're a Revelation 17 person, you're the called. But He also said you're the chosen. Matthew 22, 14 says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Let me explain something to you. Being chosen has nothing to do with winning the spiritual lottery. God doesn't pick and choose people. I know you got all kinds of all kinds of doctrines and things out there that would often make you believe that He does, but I don't believe God is going around choosing certain people to save and other people to not. Choosing certain people to use and other people to not. Do other people? Do some people seem like they have such a greater ministry than others? Sure. But well, they're the chosen. It's not because God has chosen them. It's because they have aligned themselves up in a way so that God will choose them. He's not picking people out of hats. He's not just randomly selecting people to be chosen. These people have stood out because their willingness to serve God and to sacrifice and do the things that God has called them to do being chosen has everything to do with you being the one who is willing to seek after Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. All those people I mentioned earlier could have been called and never followed. God is calling out to people all the time, but few decide to follow Him. The Apostle Paul ministered to many that didn't choose to follow Christ. Even Agrippa said, Almost thou, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Jesus spoke before thousands, but only 70 chose to really follow His instructions and answer call. You might say, well, there was 5,000 there. Yes, but only 70 could be trusted to do the call of God because of their dedication to Him. Being chosen has everything to do with you putting Him above everything else. Being chosen has everything to do with you putting yourself in a position to be picked by God. How are you going to stand out? I can tell you how you stand out. You take care of the sheep and praise them in the midst of it. You find yourself praying even in the midst of government persecution. Daniel, you might end up even in the lion's den, but God is going to bring you out. i tell you how you get chosen. You love Him more than the things of this world. You choose the fiery furnace over the pleasures of sin. You would rather be incinerated than be intimidated by the enemy. You'd rather be persecuted than to be praised by man. i tell you how you get chosen. You get rid of everything that displeases Him. Uh-oh. There's some of the things you're going to have to burn or delete. I know it's not as easy for our kids today, but I can remember... I can remember a youth conference that I went to and God convicted me so bad I went home and I can't, I can't even begin to tell you how many CDs. Yeah, I had CDs. <laughs> but I can't tell you how many CDs and even cassette tapes I watched burn in my backyard. Can't tell you how many CDs I cracked in half because I was determined. Can you go to heaven? God will judge you one day. Can you still listen to that stuff, watch the same movies, and be okay? God will have to judge that one day. 
I'm not your judge. But I can tell you this. You can't expect to be the chosen. If you're not willing to get rid of the things that come between you and God. We, we play we play around. You play around. You play around. You, play around. you do what you want to do. I'm not going to come to your house and I'm not looking for your stuff. I got too much stuff to do. And if I got to do that, you're not going to serve God anyway. I'm not one of those preachers. But I do love you enough to tell you that if you really want to do the work of God, you've got to make a decision about some things. There's some stations you're going to have to turn away from. There's some things you're going to have to do if you're going to serve God. There's some playlists you're going to have to delete. There's some movies you can't watch anymore. Well, that's too legalistic, brother. Some of y'all are telling me out. Because you decided that your country music is worth more than Jesus. Let's just be real. Those movies you like to watch that has everything that's against the Word of God in it is worth more to you than your relationship with Christ and your calling. That's too legalistic, brother. Problem is that we've ran so far from legalism that we've ran right past God. We've ran so far from legalism that we've ran right past holiness. There isn't such thing as real holiness. There isn't such thing as really living holy before God and not man's uh, interpretation of that. There is a really, there is a real deal where you can't just go away from legalism and say, well, I can do everything I want to and still be saved. That's not the way it works. I don't know if you talk like that, but it, that's not the way it works. There, there is still some things that God tells us that we shouldn't be doing. They don't say anything about music in there. It tells us to have the right set of mind. It says to think on the things of Christ. It tells us to think on those. You can't think on those things if you're listening to all that kind of garbage. Amen. And some of you will leave mad at me today. That's okay. Hebrews 12, 14. I don't do this for you. I do this for him. Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Oh! You're mad at a denomination. You're mad at what other people did to you before, but the Word says, no man shall see the Lord without holiness. I'll tell you how you stand out in the world. You don't use the same filthy words the world does. You love people the same way God loves them. You make Christ the center of everything you do. You spend time in prayer, in the Word. You praise Him in the middle of the storm. You have crazy faith. God chooses those who choose Him. 1 Peter 2, 9, but ye are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You have been chosen. You are one who has called you, you are the one he has called. You are meant to be one he has chosen. Will you walk as one worthy of the calling? Ephesians 4 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With the calling, there is, a, there is a responsibility for us to be the chosen of God as well. And then he tells us we must be faithful. He's not looking for the famous. He's looking for the faithful. Where are the Apostle Johns? Where are those who will love him? I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the John who wrote Revelation. Where are those who will love him so much that they will go wherever he goes? The 70 listened and they went out to minister. They were good. They did what God, they did what they were called to do. The twelve were there for him to really speak into and see all the signs and wonders that Jesus did. They had a closeness with God. They were chosen by God. They were close to him. There was three, though, that went into the intimate places, the garden, the mountain of transfiguration. They were there with him in those, those intimate times with him, but there was one. There was one that was closer to Jesus than any other. John was the beloved. He was the one who heard his heartbeat. He was there by his side at the table. The only disciple that was at the cross. He was the one who outran Peter to the tomb. The one who suffered much persecution but never died at the hands of martyrs. The one who was entrusted with this revelation of Jesus Christ. Because he was faithful. He was so close he leaned on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. He could hear.
hear the Savior's heartbeat. He knew what the Savior loved. He knew the desires of God because He's been so close to the Son of God. He was so faithful that He wanted to be there even at His death when everybody else ran. But look, none of these men were perfect. They weren't famous men. We would have never known their names if they had never met Jesus. You ever thought about that? Fishermen, tax collectors, commoners, people just rejected by the world. They were just men who were faithful to the cause. Jesus was a man who was faithful to the call. Isaiah 53 says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Called Jesus a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. In other words, he wasn't handsome at all. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected the man. A man of sorrow is acquainted with grief. And he hid it for, and, as, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, he was, and we esteemed him not. Surely he borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Saul, the first king of Israel, looked like a leader. He was head and shoulders above everyone, but not Jesus. Jesus was a man who grew up a tender plant and came from a dry place in a dry town. He wasn't a handsome man. There was nothing beautiful about his appearance that stood out. He was born in a barnyard to a young lady and a carpenter. Some of you make all these excuses about who you are. And I mean this for all the love of my heart, man. I hope y'all feel the love in this. Because I feel like I'm, I feel like there's some people in here who think I'm just I'm just yelling and screaming and they don't they, they're gonna leave here the same as they came. But I hope y'all feel the love in this. Because I want you to be everything that God has called you to be. Jesus. Some of you are in here today and say, well, I'm not that special. I'm not the Son of God. I'm not who these other people were. We, we've, we've romanticized these people so much we forget they were normal people. They had their faults and failures too. Jesus, we know He was from Nazareth. When they saw him, this was a famous phrasing because Nazareth was a no man's town. There wasn't a lot of special people coming out of Nazareth. They said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So I asked you today, can anything good come out of McGackersville? Can anything good come out of Shenandoah and Elton and their autos? Can anything good come out of Harrisonburg? Can anything good come out of Folks Run? Can anything good come out of Broadway? Can anything good come out of Rockingham County or Augusta County? Can anything good come out of these people that I stand in front of today? Can anything good come out of a man from Suffolk, Virginia? Doesn't matter who you are and what you've done. Doesn't matter where you're from. God can still use you and He wants to use you when you put away the excuses. He said, Jesus, so you would know you don't have to be from wealth or living fame. You just have to be faithful to the call. You can be the called, the chosen, and the faithful. You just have to know the heartbeat of the Father. You just have to get close to Him. The bad conditions of your life do not have to determine the outcome of your life. Jesus spent so much time alone in prayer with God in the three years of ministry because he wanted to hear the heartbeat of the Father. And if he spent that much time in three years of ministry, how much more time should we be spending in the years that we have on this earth to fulfill the calling that God has on our lives? He chose men to follow him that were from all walks of life to show you that he wants you to. He would rather have some people who would answer the call and live worthy of His choice and to be faithful. Fame doesn't make you great, but faithfulness to His call will. I want to end with this story. I heard a preacher tell this story recently. 
And I've been fascinated with this kind of topic anyway. And as I heard this story, I thought, well, that would go great with the message to kind of bring home the fact that it doesn't matter who you are, God can use you. In 1949, Billy Graham went to L.A. as a young evangelist to have a tent crusade. At this time, he wasn't very well known, but he started a tent crusade. He had a press conference to try to, to, try to, uh, to get people's interest into coming to this revival so he could preach to those who are lost. And not one article was written. A Presbyterian woman who was attending his revival invited Graham to her Beverly Hills home to speak to some Hollywood celebrities. There was a man by the name of Stuart Hamlin who was there. At the time, he was one of the biggest movie stars of that day. They called him the first singing cowboy. He had his own radio show where he would sing songs and play his guitar. And people, hundreds of people, thousands of people would listen to his radio show. But there was something else that Stuart Hamlin was known for. He was known for the women that he chased after. He was known for all the drinking that he did and the gambling that he did. The first three weeks he, that Graham preached in this Revival. Graham would continue to talk. Billy Graham would continue to talk with Stuart. He'd meet him for dinner, but he would never come to church. Three weeks after starting this revival, Billy Graham wanted to know from God, do I continue? This thing hasn't really got traction. There hasn't been hundreds of people showing up. Uh, do I continue this thing or do I move on somewhere else? So he prays and he asks God, what should I do and the next day? That, well, actually the next morning. Early in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, Stuart Hamlin calls him. Billy Graham picks up the phone and he says, hey, Reverend Graham, I, I, I want to come by this afternoon and talk to you. And then he begins to, he comes that afternoon and begins to pour out his heart about how he's been bound by alcohol. He's been bound by the things of his life. Him and his wife sit there while he pours out all the sins before Billy Graham. And he tells him how bad he's been. That night he came to the crusade and he gave his life to the Lord. He got on his radio show the next day and he told people about how his life has been changed. He told people, he said, y'all know me, y'all know what I've been doing, but God has radically changed my life, and I don't desire those things anymore, and He can do the same thing for you. Hundreds of people began to show up at the crusade. Hundreds of the crusade continued to go on. Hundreds of people started to go on because a man by the name of Stuart Hamlin was willing to give up everything to serve God and to fulfill the call of God on his life. He would eventually lose his job later on because he refused to play some of the same music on his radio station that he used to play. He refused to do some of the same things he used to do for the radio station. So they fired him. Later on, the LA Times would, would put their headlines would read, Sin Smashing Revival hits LA. God, do it again. Lord, send a sin-smashing revival to Rockingham County. That people's lives will be changed again. Because of Him and because of God's work in Him, many lives in Hollywood would be saved. And this would be the beginning of Graham's worldwide ministry. But it didn't end there. Hamlin's best friend was out of town that week. Several weeks later, he would come back to town and Hamlin had to go tell him about what God had done in his life. So he went to his house and he sat and talked to him for a while. His friend asked, offered him some drinks. And he said, I don't do that anymore. And he looked at his friend. Hamlin looked at his friend and said, it's no secret what God can do. His friend, some of y'all might know him, John Wayne, 
met him at the door as he was leaving. He said, look, I remember what you said earlier. He said, what was that? He said, you said, it's no secret what God can do. You ought to write that in a song. You ought to write the words of that in a song. He went home and began to write at midnight. Began to write 17 minutes later. He had all the words to that song. He had all the music to that song. God just ordained that moment for that reason. He took a drunk, a womanizer. He took a man that cared more about himself than the other people in his world, including his wife, and transformed him completely to be a servant of God. He chose to answer the call. He chose to answer the call from God and be the chosen and then remain faithful enough that he would lose his job over it and that he would follow Billy Graham along and sing for him in his crusades. His words that he wrote to that day, I want to read to you the chorus of that song. Because I believe it would speak to someone's heart this morning. It is no secret what God can do. What He's done for others, He'll do for you. With arms wide open, He'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. There's some people in this room today You've heard the call of God again on your life. This message has, the Spirit of God with this message has, has pricked your heart again to remind you of the things that God called you to do years ago. There may be some in here that God's calling you to do greater works than you're doing right now. And He just started that in you right now when you're hearing His voice for the first time saying, Come, I want you to do more. Come follow me and I'll lead you into greater things if you'll just do my work. There's some of you today that you've known the calling of God in your life, but you just want to be the chosen. You want to put yourself in a position where He'll choose you in a way where you can be more effective and anointed for His kingdom. And there's some of you here today that says, look, I've been trying to be as faithful as I can but I just want to commit to Him today that I'm going to be faithful to Him for the rest of my life and I'm going to do everything He's called me to do. Some of you have already walked in your calling. You're walking in your calling now. You're doing what He's told you to do. But you just need to tell Him one more time, I'm going to be faithful to what you've called me to do. I'm going to live for you. I can't say it one more time. I can't tell you what, you've called, what you're called to do, but God can if you'll allow Him to speak to your heart today, He'll do that. I don't care what you've done and what you've been through and where, you, where, where you're from, God can use you and God can do great works in you if you'll let Him do that. Some of you are going to have to put fear aside. Some of you are going to have to put your past aside and you're going to have to live for Him with everything that's in you. But I believe God's going to do great things if we'll allow Him to do great things in us. With every head bowed and every eye closed.